Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and Matt is out again. So if you could email the show and send some complaints in on my behalf that he's making me do all the work, Matt, you need to come back. I am taking next weekend off. So anyway, glad you can join us. We're here every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. We are helping you, the motoring public, have a better automotive experience. So if you've got questions, we've got answers. And give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Road Map, the five most dangerous recalls ever, how to maintain your steering system, and Kurt Rock from Kurt's Auto Repair came in to give me a hand helping you with your car. It's good to have you, Kurt. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your shop and how long you've been in the automotive business? Uh, good morning, Dave. It's just good to be here to say that first. Uh, the shop's up on 19, uh, 17... I-17 and Bell, 2222 West. We've been around for 25 years. Uh, we just actually done a remodel on our customer waiting lounge. It's very popular with our customers. Free coffee, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, so, man, that makes me want to Yeah, I've been trying to get you to come out. Maybe I'll get you up there Monday. I need you to pick up a tranny anyway. But uh, ever, And uh, we've been in it 25 years, got four master techs on staff, and uh, we're just proud to be part of your system. How long have you been working in cars? Uh it seems almost hard to believe, but I've done my first job for hire at 17 years old, and I'm I'm over 30 already. <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just a touch, just a touch over 30. So he's been working on cars a long time. It's a very uh, family-run business. It's close-knit. Everybody there is very experienced, and that is unusual in our business. Our business with the marketing that's there Sometimes they're willing to put anybody in a mechanic suit and say, hey, go fix cars. But there's people that know how to fix them, and there's some people not so good at it. Yeah, a lot of shops tend to hire one really good tech and pay him well and then have a bunch of uh, uh, understudies, if you will. And then that one tech runs around, you know, kind of. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not good. So anyway, one of the things I don't think we've ever covered here on the show is power steering. And it is a huge topic. And... I bet if you're listening to me right now and you've been in to get your car serviced, you've had someone come out to you and say, hey, you know, you need a power steering system flush. What the heck is that guy talking about, Kurt? Well, he's talking about basically exchanging all, this, all the fluid in your old system, and by doing so, you get rid of any uh, uh, burn fluid, any fluids that have uh, r debris, such as metal debris from the pump, and any moisture from the air. And so basically, he's saying if you do this, you will get your system to last a lot longer, and it will uh, keep your seals moist and clean. It won't run debris through your seals, and you're going to get a longer life out of your whole system. That's what he's saying. Well, when, I, when Kurt walked in the door this morning and I said, what do you think about power steering flushes? He said, well, Dave, the game has totally changed because if you go back, and he said it was before my time. Uh, <laughs> barely. <laughs> barely before my time. He said when cars got to 100,000 miles, they were junk. Yeah. The value of them deteriorated big time. It wasn't really worth anything. You were going to go get another car. But his point was, you know, sometimes I look across my shop, Dave, and I, the one in the first bay has 200,000 miles in it. The one in the second bay has 250,000 miles on it. There's one in there with 120, one in there with 50,000 miles on it. We are keeping cars longer, and so now this maintenance issue becomes more of an issue. Yes, it does. If you don't, if you don't do the power steering flush, you will probably service more steering system components than if you do do them and you have the car a long period of time. However, it's not something that needs to be done on an annual basis or anything. Maybe every every two three years type of thing. Yeah, I, w I would think that it would be good to to put it in the fifty sixty thousand mile interval, something like that. Well, I notice that power steering flushes are not uh, in the owner's manual. No, they're not, and uh, the reason for that is most owner's manuals are concerned with covering the life of the car up to the first hundred thousand miles. I believe when they write them. Uh, when we're going to drive them 200,000, uh, like I just told you, we done a Volvo yesterday, and the power steering rack and, and hoses and stuff was well over $1,000. So uh, would a flush made that car last longer as a 160,000-mile car? I'm not 100% sure it would have, but not knowing the previous history, but it would have definitely 
uh, if you start from new and you flushed them every 60, I believe you could get one extra service out of another 60,000 miles out of your flush. And it's not a lot of money to do it. So it's, it's good insurance, and I believe it is beneficial to the customer. Okay, so if I'm going to keep a car, and really maybe you should think a different perspective on the way you look at your car. If I'm going to keep a car now for 150,000 miles, well, if I service the power steering at 60,000 miles and again at 120,000 miles, I could very well avoid the expensive phone call that your rack and pinion is shot, that your power steering pump has gone bad, that you need new hoses. And uh, we were talking about the repair on that Volvo. Well, Volvo is going to tend to be a little more expensive to repair. But you could spend it anywhere if you had to do a pump, a rack and pinion, a new supply and return hose. You could spend anywhere from $600 right on up to $2,000 on some of these high-end cars. So it's a valuable investment that you don't just want to ignore. Now, I don't want to send you as the consumer, the motoring public, into a shop thinking you've got to buy everything they offer you. Because people sell things to you for different reasons. And Kurt brought up the point, people are just selling you to sell you something. They want to sell something, so they get a number at the end of the day. Uh, that's one way they may service you. Uh, the other way, uh, if you have a good relationship with a shop and you know them year after year after year, they want to do what's best, what's in your best interest. And to service your power steering, they may feel is that 60,000 miles may be a good thing. But Kurt made the point that some people are just to sell you every maintenance there is possible. Yeah, there's a... There is a certain amount of profit involved in any any service uh, and a limited liability. I mean, if they put the hose back on, you don't have a lot of liability and come back. So it becomes popular service for the the quick uh, stop places. Uh, but uh, you know this, Dave. If somebody comes into your shop and say, and you've never met them before and says, I think I need a tranny flush, and you look at their transmission fluid and it looks good, you're probably going to ask them, how often have you had this done? Do you have any records on this? And then that way you're not going to sell them a tranny flush if they said, well, I've done it 10,000 miles ago. Yeah, just because. Yeah, just, just because. Be, just because. And, and that's the advantage. If, if they keep a, a records or they go to a regular shop, we can walk in. We have customers walk in and say, uh, it's time for my 120,000-mile service. Do what it needs. And we just go back and check long, and we know what we have done and haven't done and only do the stuff that's current. So if you're in if you're in, or you're getting one of those, you're maybe in a quickie stop place. And, and I'm not a fan of those, but, you know, to be honest with you, sometimes that's what you need. Yes, you just it need is. You need to get it done quickly, and yeah. you don't have really have time. You don't need the whole car looked over. You're a good shop that you have a good relationship just did all that for you. Yes. So go ahead and get the quick oil change. Yes. I, 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 don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. But on many occasions, I want your car going into your technician who that you have a relationship with who knows the car from bumper to bumper and has seen you before, knows what you've done in the past and what you're, what you're going to do in the future. You know, he may say, you know, at 60, we do want to do that power steering flush. Well, if you're down the street getting a quick oil change, they do it for you at 50. It doesn't fit his schedule and kind of the way he's going to prescribe taking care of this vehicle. Yeah. And, and the other thing is on all of this stuff is that so many of these services are designed specifically to either avoid, uh, to extend the life of a, of a certain component or to avoid problems. But there's a lot of services that are not that way, such as fuel injector flushes, that really should be done primarily to deal with a problem, whereas a power steering flush is to avoid a problem. It's a more of an avoidance thing. So uh, let's talk quickly talk about the components that are involved. And we, we mentioned them. Your power steering is a hydraulic system that is designed to assist you in steering the vehicle. Your steering wheel work without power steering. It's just an assistance. So it's mechanically, your steering wheel is still mechanically connected to those tires. It's going to turn left. It's going to turn right. The hydraulic pump comes alongside of it and assists. It makes that easier. And there's, there's different versions, but the most common is the rack and pinion steering. That's the gear that runs, you know, the width of your car, so it connects to your right wheel out, out at the steering knuckle, it connects to your left wheel out at the steering knuckle, and it's basically a big, long tube, uh, and, and basically the hydraulic pressure is going in there, and that steering gear is, is in there. It's rolling back and forth. Rack and pinion didn't used to be as common back in the day, but I think it's, it's I mean, it's using a lot of trucks, you know, where it didn't used to be. Yeah, if you, if I was just about ready to ask you because you asked me on them recalls if you remember the first American car that was produced with a rack and pinion, and it's the first one I asked if it was on that recall. The Ford Pinto was the first American car produced with a rack. Oh, 
Oh, the Ford Pinto. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> when we come back, we're going to let you know what the five most dangerous recalls are. And we've got a lot of open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. Matt Allen is out today, but we've got Kurt Rock from Kurt's Auto Repair in with uh, over like uh, four decades. <laughs> he didn't <laughs> Not give, quite. He didn't give us a number of how long he's been working on cars, but uh, we figured he was qualified because he's seen a car or two and he could help me answer any of the questions you might have. And uh, one thing that... Uh, I love about Kurt's Auto Repair. Uh, they are on the Bumper to Bumper list at bumper to bumper radio dot com. But I feel honored to be able to recommend them because they are a fantastic shop. And if I know anyone even close to that area of town, I send them there. And one of the things that recently came up for them is they were awarded as a finalist for the BBB Ethics Award for 2013. 2013. Tell yes. us about that, Kurt. Uh, it's Better Business Bureau does their annual ethics award. They have five categories uh, based on number of employees. We were in the the category of uh, one to ten employees. There's three businesses in the whole state of Arizona that qualify for finalists, and we were one of the three that did. And so we're very honored and very humbled to get that award. Well, that's great. And I saw we're going to put some pictures up online at bumper to bumper radio dot com of Kurt and Kathy holding that trophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's very good to have you be part of the network, Kurt. And uh, you I consider you a flagship shop for our industry. Well, thank you, Dave. Up first, this segment, we are going to go with Randy in Peoria. He's got a 2000 Mercedes. Go ahead, Randy. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Morning, guys. I've been having some uh, problems with uh, my wife's car at uh, last fall, the air conditioning seemed to be not cooling as well as it should. Then during the winter, it didn't heat as good as it should. And I took it to a couple of shops, and one of them told me I needed condenser fans. Um, the next shop told me I needed a uh, fan clutch, which the fan clutch was weak, and I did replace but at their recommendation, I would have spent 1400 bucks uh, without any change. I'm wondering, is there a vacuum or electric switch that would make the air conditioning and heat work at the same time? Go ahead, Kurt. Uh, uh, the thing that he said that makes me wonder if he isn't dealing with a control issue, Dave, is he says it doesn't cool as good and it doesn't heat as good. Uh, so I would wonder about the the uh, Mercedes-Benz, the control head, or a blend air door. Either one of them would come to mind, and I'd, I'd certainly want to check that out because something's going on there where he's not getting the proper flow over either the heater core or the evaporator core. And that's that's actually more common in these cars than, than these people might think. So we could have an AC system that we're working good. So we've got uh, good condensing up there. Uh, we've got a compressor that's doing its job. It's making cold air. The evap coil is getting cold, but we're getting a mixture of heat and cold coming through the vents. And there's yeah. a blend door inside that dashboard. In the old days, they were almost all vacuum controlled. Later model or more electric actuator motors, uh, but uh, 2000, is it still kind of in the vacuum area? I think? I think you could be in the area where there could be a lot of vacuum controls on that. But the thing to do would be to have somebody uh, check them blend air doors, make sure they're sealing, make sure the controls are working, because we have had a couple control head issues on Mercedes over the years, too. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to take this chance to talk about diagnostic, because he said, you know, I would have, if, if I would have done what they said, I would have spent fourteen hundred dollars uh, and wouldn't really had much more benefit, um, you know, and, and especially we can do it. We can look at any older model car, and we can we can point to the AC system and all the things that will make some sort of difference. Well, the fan clutch is weak. You know what? It's not getting as much flow across the condenser. That will have an effect. How much? We don't know, but it is weak. Condenser fan, same thing. We've got a weak condenser fan motor. It's not pulling air like it should, or we've got restriction. The, the condenser fins are dirty, things like that. But you can spend all that money and skip out on what really is going to fix the problem. In this case, it may be a blend door issue or a control head issue. And, you know, Kurt's point today, we were talking about diagnostic. And uh, we put a, a blog up at ktr.com about diagnostic, and it's do we pay for it, don't we pay for it? That is the hardest part of auto repair. 
Yes, it is, because if somebody would thoroughly diagnose that, uh, and he, and the other thing is if he would get all the information from the customer, if he would say, hey, my heat is not as hot, my cold is not as cold, and they'd thoroughly diagnose it, they might spend, what, Dave, $200, $250, and then they'd know exactly what they need to fix. The thing about a fan clutch uh, on a Mercedes-Benz on the German cars, if a fan clutch ain't working, you're noticing it right away because that temperature gauge is going bonsai. Mm, right, right. So there's other issues involved in there. So I think of, of good diagnoses would be his best money spent on something like that. Well, Randy, we really appreciate the phone call. And then, you know, and I think to the diagnostic, it is worthy. It is worthwhile. If you have a good, experienced technician who's going to put intellectual time, intellectual properties into figuring out what, what's wrong with your car, it's worth paying for it versus pitching parts of the car. Uh, you know, it's not worth it. All auto shops are driven by the same economic engine. Absolutely. And so one guy can't afford to do it for free just because you're buying a work. So you pay for it whether you think you are or not, whether it be in a wrong part, whether it be in a guy who feels a little entitled because he did all this diagnostic work you're not paying for, so he's going to sell you something extra. You don't want a technician that's entitled. <laughs> no, you do not. <laughs> so we are going to go with, looks like, Dave in Sun City. He's got a 2000 Saturn. Go ahead, Dave. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, I just uh, bought this car about two weeks ago. Very nice little unit, CLS2. Got all the bells and whistles. Very nice. Um, I looked online because, of course, there is no owner's manual in the glove box. And I found that it requires 530 oil. And in the desert, just five handle it. How, how many miles are on that Saturn, Dave? Well, it's got an engine with 40. Engine with 40,000 miles on it. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is a very common question, and this school of thought has really changed. You know, in the old days, oils weren't as good as they are today. In the old days, we'd say, you know, yeah, my, my grandfather told me to go ahead, and it's awful hot out here, and I think we're going to go ahead and step that thing up to a good old 40 weight. That's all we need in Phoenix. Uh, with later model cars, correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt, I think that, that theory has kind of changed. It absolutely has. I uh I have a lot of opinions on this. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have opinions. Yeah. Uh, the old days we had cork gaskets and loose tolerances, and we had to do something that wouldn't run out on the ground, and that's part of what they did that. Actually, viscosity-enhancing packages is what boosts that up. The heavier the VI, the more heat the engine oil holds and the slower it flows during startup. So absolutely a 530 is a good choice on that car. So I would stick with that. It's been through engineering, and they did consider, you know, back in the old days, I'd say, well, the car was designed in Michigan. What do they know about Arizona? <laughs> well, General Motors did have a did have a uh, R&D out here, did they not? Yes, they did. <laughs> For a lot of years, because this is a great place to test high temperatures, whether that be on brakes or on the engine or whatever yeah. it may be. So uh, we are talking about power steering today or anything you really want to talk about, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827. And I promise when we get back, we will be talking about the five most dangerous recalls ever. And uh, this list, I think, only goes back 30 years because Kurt brought to my attention some uh, pretty dangerous bomb, baboom-type <laughs> car situations and uh, how to stay away from those. So open lines at 602-277-5827. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. Matt Allen is out. We've got Kurt Rock from Kurt's Auto Repair at I-17 in Bell with four decades of, uh, he's going to get mad at me when I say that, <laughs> of auto repair experience. Uh, he came in here to help us help you with the car. So we've got uh, Fred, Sean, uh, Manuel, John, and Robert, and I, we've got no ladies calling today. So if you're out there and you're a woman and you have a car question, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, it's feeling a little too testosterone today. Testosterone today. That's Ain't a that word. a Ferrari? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So we are going to go with Manuel on an 02 Ford Ranger. Go ahead, Manuel. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, on my Ranger, uh, I'm, I'm getting like a clicking noise from underneath, uh, like the driver's side. It comes and it goes. I notice it when I'm actually pulling my boat, and I'm curious to you know what uh, what it could be. It's uh, is it automatic or manual? It's an automatic. And you're hearing it under your driver's seat. Correct. Uh, no, 
Well, it's under the driver's, like the dry, uh, the front tire. Clicking on the front tire. You got anything, Kurt? Well, the only thing I was wondering is if he had some kind of, when he's pulling his boat, he's changing the angle of the of the whole thing. There's weight on the back. Maybe he's got a, a, a wheel bearing or a wheel speed sensor a little loose or something that he's touching. Hey, Manuel, can I ask you to make the noise for us? No one's listening. Well, well you know what? It's like, it's like a ticking noise and everything like that. It sounds kind of like, to me, it's like, like a valve. Because I did have a Toyota back, but I had to have, the I, I, I guess, the valve adjusted or something. Well, here's the thing. Is it consistent with, uh, you know, it, it's up in that tire area. Is it related to wheel speed at all? So the faster the car goes, the more consistent the noise is? No, no it, it actually, I actually had it uh, about parked in my driveway and everything, and it was still it was still ticking and everything, and I would give it a little bit of gas, and then the ticking noise would, would, would get a little bit faster with the speed of the, the, with the motor and everything. But it, it'll come and it'll go. I mean, the next morning I tried to look at it a little bit closer and the noise was gone. Oh, I, it, to me, it's so hard to uh, do noises over the phone. It, you know, I was really trying to get him to do it for us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? If it'll go, if it'll do it with it not running or without moving, he probably does have something in piston slap, lifter ticking, something lifter like that. Lifter ticking. So it sounds engine related. Yeah. And when he's towing his boat, he's working the engine a lot harder yeah. than when he's not towing the boat. So yeah. it is engine, engine related. So. That's what I would suggest. At first, I thought he was talking about, you know, maybe something in the wheel, yeah. like you were thinking. Yeah. So thanks for the call, Manuel. If you need a shop to look at that, bumper-to-bumperradio.com. There's a list of great shops, such as Kurtz at I-17 and Bell. It didn't say here what part of town you're in, but uh, almost anywhere in the valley, you should be able to find somebody. So we are going to go with John in Phoenix on a 2000 Ford Explorer. Go ahead, John. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. John? Uh, we'll throw John back on a hold here, and it looks like we are going to go with Sean in Phoenix on a 2008 Hyundai Sonata. Go ahead, Sean. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, thanks. Um, so power steering issue, since that's the topic of the day. So when I'm driving, uh, the power steering sometimes is hard, sometimes not. Typically when I'm coming off the freeway and I'm making that slight on-ramp turn, um, I notice as I'm turning the wheel, it gets a little hard, and then all of a sudden it'll break free, and it works great. And it's a sporadic thing. I do notice it a little bit more in the summertime as the, as the heat, um, as it starts to get warmer. Um, but we're driving on the straight streets here in Arizona. We don't use the power steering all the time, and that's what's really hard for me to uh, to determine what's going on. So when you're maneuvering in a parking lot, you know, Three point turn, all that stuff. Does it is it work? Is it functioning fine there? Everything's fine. Yep. But after you go out and you cruise on the freeway and you get off the off ramp, that's when you feel it. Does it? It's just hard to hard to move. It's hard to turn, and as I as I turn it more, um, all of a sudden it'll break free and it's fine, no problem. Um, it, it, like I said, it's just a sporadic issue. I'm thinking maybe the power steering pump. That's the only thing that I can think of. Have you serviced the fluid at all, and how many miles are on it? Uh, there's 134,000 on the car, and I've had the fluid flushed. Hyundai's looked at it. They couldn't find anything. They checked all the filters and the fluid also. They said they couldn't find anything. Of course, they don't want to take the time to go out and drive it for a day or two, so you never know. Well, Kurt, anything jumps to you and jumps to mind? Well, it sounds like he's got a, a, a valve sticking or something in the in the pump or the rack or somewhere in there. And so, if he serviced a fluid, he's probably just got wear and a, like a little binding, a little know. binding that goes on. I yeah. mean, in my mind, and yeah. you know, you're the you're the general repair guy. If you're out on the freeway, the engine's running 2,500 RPM for a long length of time. Does that fluid foam at all? No, it, it shouldn't foam at all if, as long as everything is fine. Uh, you're just going from the pump to the rack and back because, obviously, you're not using any of the assist to run down the road at straight. And so I think he's got a binding valve in, in the pump or the rack or somewhere in there that he needs to – it's probably just getting worn and he needs to diagnose which one it is. Well, there's back to that word diagnose, and it's my soapbox because I find that people don't like paying for diagnostic. And I think it's the best money you could send. He said they probably didn't want to go drive it. <laughs> uh, no, that takes time. And it does. It takes time. And, and if the technician's working, he's being paid. If he's driving cars, he's not being paid. And the best way for you not to spend money needlessly 
because you could say, well, let's put a pump in it, let's put a rack in it, let's replace the hoses. Well, that sounds pretty expensive. <laughs> yeah, well, that would fix it, though. It That's... would fix it, guaranteed to <laughs> yeah. fix it. But to truly diagnose, diagnose it and uh, find out what's going on with it is, is worthwhile to do that. So thank you so much for the call. Uh, you know, if uh, you're looking for a good shop, you know, be willing to give them some time with it to find it, maybe go drive it. And, uh, you know, how annoying is it and is it worth chasing is the other thing to consider when we have an intermittent issue or just do you live with it? Because if it's real expensive and it's really not that annoying, uh, you know, it might be worth living it, living with it, 130,000 miles, car's not new, it's not going to drive like it's brand new. So we're going to go with Fred in Mesa on a 2001 Mazda pickup. Go ahead, Fred, you're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys, appreciate you taking the call. You bet. So I'm guessing it's a transmission issue, but, um, you know, the Mazda V2300, the Ford Ranger, either one. My issue is that I'm driving down the road in my neighborhood. We have the speed humps. And as I slow down for the speed hump and then reaccelerate right after the speed hump, I have a lag and a, a catch at what feels like in the transmission from the, the gear shift from slowing down to speeding back up again. And I've only noticed it when I am doing that speed bump, is slow that, down to speed up. Is that when you're leaving the house cold, the vehicle's been cold in the morning? Uh, no, it is not. It's actually, now you say that, it is mostly when it's warmed up. Mostly warm. And when you say delay and then it catches and how many miles are on it, is it is it delay? Is that literally like, you know, just a split-second delay, or does it just lag and when it grabs, it really grabs and lets you know it? The latter. It's uh, probably a one-second delay, and it does grab. I don't accelerate very hard, and if I accelerate extremely softly, then it doesn't get that hard catch of the next gear, and it's 78,000 miles. 78,000 miles. It's it's relatively young. Uh, one of the things that I see go bad on, on the Rangers or on the, uh, you know, the Mazda pickup, it's really the same thing. It's a 4R44E, and uh, there's a couple of, uh, there's bands that apply for the gear shifts, a couple of bands, and there's a cumul or uh, servo pistons that are on the right side of the transmission. And what happens with age, the, the vehicle is now 14 years old, is they deteriorate and the exhaust runs along right along the right side of that transmission. So a lot of these idiosyncrasies that we get with this transmission, a lot of times we can cure by dropping the exhaust and replacing the servo pistons that apply that. So those would be that would be the first thing that would come to my mind that I would be thinking about. And the fact that it acts different warm versus cold you know, I think that plays into, you know, we've got seals or something that are going bad. So thank you so much for the call. And I've been asking Kurt here all along if he's got any guesses on my uh, five worst recalls ever. And I pulled this off of Auto Week, which is actually a pretty neat little website that's out there, autoweek.com. And uh, Kurt started naming someone he came in this morning. I go, that's not on there. That's not on there. Well, that's because it was 40 years ago, Dave. <laughs> well, right. These people only go back 35 years. So they're not, I don't think it's the five, uh, it says five worst car recalls of all time. Well, that's just not true. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what would you think the number one worst would be? And then I'll give you the real answer. Well, my initial guess was the exploding Pintos. And Dave said that was not on there. So I was wrong. What year was that? Uh, mid-70s is when they had all the hassles with them. Mid-70s. Okay, so if you're looking for a used car, Pinto is probably not a good choice. Unless you're going to get the license plate, ba-boom, then I think it is worth it just for the nostalgia of the whole deal. Yeah, and you may want to stay away from the Firestone 500 tires that year or two. So the earliest one they went here was 1981 General Motors, and it was on the Chevrolet Malibu and a few other vehicles. It affected 5.8 million, ca or, yeah, million cars, and it was loose uh, steering bolts. So the steering huh. would just come disconnected while you're driving down the road. So that's the number five. So that's the least severe. I don't remember that. Do you remember that? I'm not sure that it was if it was steering bolts or it was that rag joint in the steering column. I think it might have been that. Okay, that's exactly what it says. Man, Kurt's good. He's been doing this 40 years. <laughs> sometimes a suspension bolt coming loose isn't a big deal, but sometimes it's a 1981 General Motors model. A loose suspension bolt was found actually to cause the car's steering column to become disabled. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Pretty good. All right, the next one up, and Kurt did guess this one, is a 1996 Ford Ranger, and apparently these things just burst into flames. Do you remember that one? 
Uh, I remember there was a few of them, but I was wondering if that wasn't that switch that had constant power uh, all the time, uh, and then it'd get to leaking, and then it burst into flames and kind of cause uh, garages to burn down, which were attached to houses and stuff. Yeah, that one's frowned upon. It says here there was no one killed to this one, but a lot of garages, a lot of houses burned down. I remember Ford Taurus is bursting into flames, and I thought it was ignition switch related, but that's not on here. And I actually saw one burst into flames uh, right across the street from the shop I changed tires at when yeah. I was a kid. So the next 2004 General Motors, this one does not impress me. It's not hair raising. I don't even know why they put it here. Apparently, tailgates were falling off. Have you heard anything about that? Well, it don't impress you because you weren't following the car. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> I guess it would be more impressive yeah, then, wouldn't it? Yeah, you'd be more impressed if you were following it. So the the cables uh, were getting corroded, and it was just falling off the car. Yeah. I, I, I don't even remember hearing about this one. I, yeah, I think I heard something about that. Okay. Now, uh, number two on the list, the 2005 through 2009 uh, Ford vehicles affected $8.6 million. And again, let's see, uh, this was related to the cruise control. Do you remember this? Yes, that's the cruise control switch that... that they didn't have. They had a constant power source to it. Apparently, these things burst into flames. Yeah. Why is this a problem? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, if you're the neighbor, you'd know. All right. Well, the number one, uh, you know, uh, other than cars bursting into flames, was 2009 through 2011 Toyota Corolla type vehicles that uh, they said the gas pedal was sticking underneath the floor mat. I think that was bogus, but the reason this one is number one is there was 31 deaths related to this floor mat problem. Do you believe it, floor mat? Uh, I believe there are 31 deaths related. <laughs> I've got my my doubts. I have a customer that experienced that, and if you talk to her, uh, she will vehemently deny that it was a floor mat. But floor mat deal. I never, I, I never bought it, but we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and Matt Allen is out. So we've got Kurt Rock from Kurt's Auto Repair. That is at I-17 in Bell Road is the closest cross street that I can point out to you. Fantastic shop, very family run, and he mentioned all ASC master technicians work there? No, I, I've got all, all my technicians are ASC certified. I've got four master techs in the shop. Four master techs. That's pretty rare. So everyone that's going to be looking at your car knows what they're doing. It's not some guy running around going, oh, don't do that. <laughs> don't put that there. Don't pour that in there. So they all know what they're doing, and your car is an investment. You want it taken care of. Uh, you want to trust it the right people. Uh, Kurtz is just an example of all the great shops that you find at Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, you know, there's I, I believe there's literally 800 auto shops in this town. There's a bunch. You know, and and when Matt and I talk about it, it's like you know which ones do we feel would we feel good saying these are great shops. You know, that there's some we know and some we don't know, but yeah. there is a lot of good people in our business, whether we know them or not. That is so true. in our profession, just because they're not part of the bumper to bumper, if you've got a great relationship with them, stick with them. Uh, if you're looking for a great, really great relationship with the shop, bumper to bumper radio.com. We've got Kay, Robert and Adam. We're going to go with Kay because she is the first lady caller of the day. Go ahead, Kay. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Hello. Okay, so I have a two-part question. Um, recently, my car, I was on the freeway, and it completely just stopped. And I took it to the dealership, and we found out all the, um, what do you want to call it, the, um, the inside, when you open the trunk, and you have all your little pulleys. I'm not sure what you call them, but they're all broken, all the little rubber. Okay, it's a. Mer I should have mentioned no. to Kurt because Kurt's here in the dark. It's a 2000 Mercedes. So you're driving on the freeway, your car just quits. Yes, and all the belts were every. I mean, they were off the. Everything that's in the inside when you open it, all the belts were off. They okay. were torn apart. Okay, did you get it? You got it towed into the shop from there. I did, and they told me they'll fix it because I had, I had purchased it recently, and what happened afterwards? Maybe a couple days later. Um, I pull in my garage, and there's just liquid coming from the bottom fluid. And now I noticed it's my power stirring. Mm. I haven't had a chance to take it back. And my question is, should I take it? Could it be part of the repair? Is the power stirring something they would have had to take apart to get to? 
those all the um, belts they replaced, or should I? Would it be another fee of repair? They could all be related, or they could totally not be related, based off of what you're saying. So, more than likely, you know, the car threw a belt out there on the freeway. Yeah, and yeah. and that's not an uncommon thing to happen. Uh, you know, and for for others listening, they might know belts are one of those things that will put you on the side of the road very quickly. Uh, so, when your technician that you trust and have a relationship with tells you it's time for a belt, go ahead and buy it. Yeah. Money well spent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it very well could be just that it threw belts. Well, I was thinking maybe some collateral damage from the belts because they get all mm. twisted up and everything. And if they'd have got in behind that seal on that pulley, it could be related but not really part of the repair, just collateral damage. Collateral damage. Yeah. That does happen a lot. Yeah. So the other thing I was thinking is you know, maybe the power string was leaking and it got on the belt, and that's why it threw a belt. That's possible. Possible, too. So they could be related. They could be completely unrelated. But uh, they sound like uh, they took care of you when the belts came off, and uh, just go to them and say, "Hey, this is what happened," and and they'll shoot you straight. Yeah, you know. So, anyway, thanks so much for the call, Kate. We are going to go with Robert in Phoenix on a 1985 Buick Regal. Go ahead, Robert. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, uh, I got a car that's been sitting in the garage for about a little over a year. It's got a little less than half a tank in it, and I was wondering, is it okay to start it up? Also, when I was running it before, it used to spit out a little bit of water. Do I have any head gasket issues with that? What's a little bit of water? Uh, just, just, just a tiny bit. It's just, you know, like, it's just spitting it out, you know, just like every every so often. For sure. Well, I think um, to the water question, a lot of water is actually created in the combustion process, and people don't realize yeah. that. That's how your exhaust gets rusty. So we're going to hope you don't have a bonehead gasket because yeah. that would be no fun. But what do you think about the gas sitting for a year, Kurt? If it was my car, and I've, I've had two of these li- lately, one this week and one a month ago, we drain the tank, put in fresh, then start it and see what we got. Just change the fuel filter, put in fresh fuel, and, and see what you got. Most of the time, you'll be fine. That much, uh, that much, a year old on gas that ain't been treated, it it could cause more trouble than it's worth. So I think it'd be worth draining it. Now, if you're going to set a car and you were going to store it for six months or a year, does that treated gas with that stay bill that you can add to it? Does it certainly help it? It certainly helps it. Okay, so that's that's a worthwhile product. Yeah, and the other problem is if the tank's got half a tank of gas, then any moisture gets in it, you'll get rust in the tank and stuff in that gas, too. So I'd put in a full tank of fresh gas, a new oil, a new fuel filter, and then see what you got. Thanks for the call, Robert. We are going to go with Adam in uh, Tempe on a 2003 uh, Nissan Xterra. Go ahead, Adam. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good afternoon. Well, I'll keep it short. Uh, basically, what I'm having is in the summertime – um, the car, if it sits at idle, it'll start to creep up to hot. Um, last year we threw a, or we blew out one of the hoses, had the hose replaced, um, and the system flushed out. Now, after that, during the wintertime months, runs just fine. You can idle it forever, no problem. But as we start to creep up into the higher temperatures, uh, the longer you sit at idle, you'll start to see that. Uh, temperature sensor creep up towards the red line. Once you start moving again, it goes right back to normal, and it runs just fine. I'm wondering if that could be a thermostat issue. I don't have any check engine lights or anything showing up. Did you do the hose repair yourself, or was it performed by an auto shop? We we did the hose repair ourselves, and then we had the system flushed um, professionally after that, thinking that maybe it had some air in the lines or something. Okay. Well, I think uh, one of the things that we mentioned here in the past is that, you know, when you have a, a hose blow off, um, and we refill the system. Late model cars, it's so hard to get all the air out of the system. So when you have an air pocket in there, you know, it, it, it's hard to get it blood out. And we vacuum fill these cooling systems. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first thing that j- comes to my mind. I was wondering if it was an engine-driven cooling fan or an electronic cooling fan heating at an idle, uh, if he's got a pair of fans and one of them not working, or a clutch fan that ain't working and he has to have some movement over it. Uh, he said he had it flushed later so hopefully they've done a, a good job of removing that but i'd be looking at that or a plugged radiator or something like that well adam you were lucky because you were in tempe and uh basically right off mcclintock you've got arizona import specialist uh joel bartko owns the place he worked at nissan for uh two decades before he went into his own business so he's fantastic with nissan x terras he's just one of the great shops at bumper to bumper radio.com so uh, 
Kurt, thanks for coming us coming in. Tell us again where your shop's at. I-17 and Bell. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Peter, for putting on a great show. And if you're looking for a great shop to get a relationship going with, everybody's got to have a guy. you got to have a car guy. Bumper to BumperRadio.com. I am expecting Matt to be back with us next week. It's going to feel a little strange. Thanks so much.